Uh, tonight we've got Dr. Scott Forschler speaking with us. He's received his PhD at the University of Minnesota, been teaching and writing about ethics for almost a decade. He's spoken on secular ethics to student groups throughout the Midwest, and has been a presenter at professional conferences both in the United States and abroad. He's a philosophy instructor at St. Cloud Technical and Community College, and is currently working on a book on the foundations of immorality. And we are both privileged and honored to have him with us this afternoon. Thank you, Doctor. So, uh, to thank you for braving the weather here. I uh, hope everyone made it safely who tried to come here. And uh, I will be telling you tonight about uh, demystifying morality, trying to make it uh, its origins clear as possible and, and uh, dissuade you from various mistaken views about the origins of morality. I'm going to tell you where moral judgments come from and what makes them justified and how a correct understanding of the first leads you to the second. When I do so, I'm uh, perhaps will be speaking to and disagreeing with some who believe that ethical motivation and judgments have supernatural, religious, or at any rate mysterious and non-natural origins. I will try to show you that such beliefs are not only completely unnecessary, they are deeply wrong and can lead to great moral harm. But I'm also speaking to and certainly disagreeing with some of my secular compatriots who may believe in various other naturalized theories of ethics, for I believe that the majority of what are commonly passed off as secular theories of ethics are also deeply mistaken and can lead to great moral harm if they were taken too seriously. It is a virtue, however, of some forms of hypocrisy that some people claim to believe in moral theories which are deeply mistaken but do not, in fact, act on them. Could, could you, next slide here. So, here are some mistaken views of ethics. Some people say they get it all from the Bible or they do whatever their genes tell them to do whatever values feel right to them, uh, genetically, naturally, uh, or you do whatever your society says. Today, everybody gets their morality from society. It's all due to upbringing, and you're just mechanically following them through. Some people claim to believe that morality comes from one of these sources or something similar. These are mistaken. I believe that many people who hold mistaken beliefs about the source of ethics ignore their moral theory in practice, and often enough do the right thing Anyway, next slide. It's a good thing that they do not always follow their bulk morality, the claim morality they claim to espouse. A famous literary example of this is Huckleberry Finn. Uh, I'm sorry, no, I was just, I was just pointing to the picture. Uh, that's, that's, that's what the picture is of there. Okay. Uh, who, Huckleberry Finn, you may recall, refused to turn Jim into the slave catchers, <coughs> even though he accepted a deeply mistaken moral theory which endorsed the opposing action, endorsed turning in, in Jim. I believe that many of us are more or less like Huck Finn. We do the right thing even if we're not quite sure why it's right, or even when we verbally endorse opposing views, which would tell, which if we took them seriously, would lead us radically astray. I also believe that when we do the wrong thing, which we often enough do, we're all human, we make mistakes, it's more likely that we will do that because we succumb to a temptation in a case where we really knew what we were doing is wrong, deep down. Not so much because we have a mistaken theory of morality. I think moral theories actually have less influence on us than at least some philosophers would like to think. But I do think that sometimes having the wrong moral theory can lead us to make the wrong, wrong moral choice, or at least to be too vulnerable to or tolerant of the claims of some people who demand the right to make erroneous moral choices or to convince us to do the same and follow their lead. So sometimes I think moral theory does have some pernicious effects if you have the wrong one. So I think in perhaps getting clear on the nature of morality can reduce the chance somewhat that we're going to make such mistakes, but I do have modest aspirations there. Apart from that, however, I think many people believe that morality has something of the air of the supernatural about it, and hence argue that if we believe, as we should, in moral facts, uh, then we must believe in some supernatural source for them. The very least I hope to do tonight is not to improve your moral conduct and not to even convince you that there are no, are no supernatural entities, but simply to show you that, that the existence of moral facts does not, I'm sorry, uh, does not require the existence of anything supernatural. For morality's origin and justification is entirely natural, albeit a uniquely and distinctly fascinating aspect of the part of the universe we happen to inhabit. 
To understand the nature of moral judgments, we must first get a clear understanding of what a moral judgment is. Rather than offer a complete definition, I'm going to start with some minimal conditions, and then try to show you that these minimal conditions are all we really need to understand morality. So whatever else a moral judgment is, I'm going to submit it is a value, or a valuation. That is, an approval or disapproval of something. So, let's begin by trying to understand values. Philosophers often talk about values and contrast them with facts. In fact, there's a, there's a famous uh, conundrum in philosophy called the fact-value dichotomy, or distinction, or the fact-value problem. How do you go from facts to values? Because uh, they, they seem to be very different things. Uh, the two are indeed obviously distinct. I believe that Syria has a tyrannical government, but I do not value this government's existence. So there's a, I, I believe, have a belief about it and a value about it, and they do not coincide. I believe that there is water in the bottle to my left, and I value my drinking it at some point in the future, but I'm not drinking it now. So we have beliefs there, we have values, they're not always identical. They don't always match the world. Sometimes they do. <laughs> but sometimes they don't. So what are these mysterious things, values? We think we have a handle on beliefs, although philosophers will point out there's a lot more, there's a lot more depth to beliefs than perhaps we think and, and facts. But values are, are at any rate even, they seem even more mysterious than beliefs and, and facts. Well, I'm going to suggest that they actually are very much like beliefs in certain respects. Like beliefs, they are representations of states of affairs. But while beliefs represent these states as actual, values represent them as things to be achieved or maintained, as states of affairs that motivate us to try to make the world like them. Um, put it another way, they, they, they tend to motivate the organism that has them to make the world more like the valued representation, or to keep the world that way if the values match its beliefs about how the world currently is. Next slide. There is nothing supernatural about values unless you believe that squirrels are supernatural beings. For squirrels obviously engage in valuational behavior much like we do. They, for instance, they value acorns and they disvalue foxes. Notice that the representational power of both beliefs and values vary greatly in their range of detail and comprehensiveness. And this is true for both. So there's no real distinction between values and facts that one is more precise or real than the other. A squirrel valuing an acorn, for instance, may have a very specific idea about what, about what it wants to bring about. The, perhaps the acorns being in a certain hiding place under that tree over there. A squirrel disvaluing the presence of the fox may have a much vaguer representation of what it wants to be the case. It wants the fox to be anywhere but here. Or perhaps it wants itself to be pretty much anywhere except near the fox. By saying the squirrel represents things, understand, I'm not saying that it is consciously thinking of them at the moment. Just that somewhere in its little squirrely brain is enough of a picture of what it is like for the value, uh, its value concerning the fox, to either match the world or not. So that it can respond appropriately with running away from the fox when its beliefs about the fox do not match its values, and uh, so also that it can stop and rest when it comes to believe that the spatial relationship between it and the fox matches the squirrel's values respecting the same. So I trust you will agree that as representations of actual or desired states of affairs, there's nothing the least bit supernatural about either beliefs or values. Now, how these are instantiated in our brains, that's a question for neuroscience. Uh, that they can be and are so instantiated in our neural circuitry is beyond any doubt. There's just too much correlation between brain and mind, uh, beliefs and behavior and so forth, to, to have any serious doubt about this. The brain of a squirrel, I remind you, is more complicated, far more complicated in both memory space and processing power than the most sophisticated supercomputer in the world. And I'm certain there's plenty of room in there to represent acorns, foxes, and much else. So much for values. But not all values are moral values. So we must figure out what distinguishes the latter from ordinary run-of-the-mill values. Next slide. Consider the following cases. One, through sheer accident, I trip on a bump on the sidewalk, falling and experiencing some pain. Two, someone else trips on such a bump, falling into me, so I'm knocked over again, experiencing some pain. Again, accidentally. 
Three, someone passing me intentionally kicks my shin, tripping me so I fall over and experience some pain. Four, someone tries to kick me with this result, but misses, or I dodge the kick, and I do not fall, and I do not experience pain. Five, somebody is there, they do not kick me, but they watch me walk down the sidewalk and in a fit of malicious schadenfreude, hopes that I painfully trip, <laughs> eagerly anticipating the delight of watching me howl in pain. Now, I think it is clear that it would be quite inappropriate to make a moral judgment in, of any of the persons in cases one and two. It's all accidental. Nothing intentionally has been done wrong. You would, it would be crazy to say that the, any moral wrongdoing was done here. Uh, but we would negatively judge the other person in cases three and four, and I think also in case five, although perhaps to a different degree, since they didn't actually do anything to cause the event, whether it happened or not. Well, I think what this shows is that what we mean by a moral judgment does not necessarily involve a judgment that pain, or its avoidance, or its opposites like pleasure or happiness, has occurred, or has been inflicted, or brought about. It is always directed towards a person in some way, and yet the mere causal connection between a person's bodily behavior and some pain, as in case two, does not generate a moral judgment. Rather, it seems, moral judgments are about another person's values or their intentional activities. In the case five, it's purely a value. In the case, in cases three and four, we're talking about an intentional activity. But intentional activities are behaviors motivated by a person's values. You know, so again, if there were, in the case where there's a similar behavior like number two, but there's no in, there's no value of tripping me. It's simply an accident that the other person's body knocks me over. Um, we don't make a moral judgment there. So if intentional activity is just activity caused in an appropriate way by a value, and we either evaluate bare values or intentional activities, it seems ultimately what we're valuing are other people's values. So in short, what, whatever else a moral judgment is, it is a valuation of some other valuational behavior, or what philosophers call a second order valuation. Next slide. Philosophers love talking about second order, or more generally, higher order thought, or actions, or activity, or concepts. I, in particular, love this concept, higher order. I've never met a higher order theory I'm not fascinated by. We have higher order beliefs. I think this is really at the heart of life, as, uh, human life, as well as philosophy in particular. Now, it's very interesting. We'll just touch on it a little bit here. We have higher order beliefs. Beliefs about beliefs. We have higher order values, values about values. And as far as we know, this capacity to go higher order in our thinking is unique in the universe. No other animals can think about thinking or value their own values. At some point in time, our ancestors somehow acquired this amazing recursive mental capacity, this capacity to make representations of our own representational behavior. Nothing has been the same ever since. We've been thinking about thinking, talking about talking, Constructing tools we make other tools with. And judging our own and each other's judgments. This leads to questions about the meaning of life and about the value of our valuations. Questions which are at the heart of my discipline, philosophy. Which rather than being content in first order activity, relentlessly asks why. Raising that higher order question whenever we can. But I don't think you need to be a philosopher to go higher order. Or if you do, perhaps everyone is a little bit of a philosopher to that extent. Because in our ordinary lives, we do this all the time. We talk about talking. We make art about art. We write books about books. We watch movies about movie making. You have seen Fellini's Eight and a Half and many others along those lines. And I once saw a woman wearing a hat with another hat on top of it. <laughs> I told her, your hat has a hat. Well, that's not exactly a higher order hat, but you see what I'm getting at. Um, higher order activity, recursiveness in general, can be very amusing. It leads into in the sort of paradoxes. The liar paradox is an instance of higher order thinking that leads to some danger. Um, it's also a tremendously powerful tool, for it breaks us away from a limited range of pre-programmed instincts, like the squirrel or the fox have and opens the door to a more general understanding and mastery of the universe and of ourselves, because we no longer merely see the world from the one point of view that we're programmed to see it from. 
We have the capacity to step back, to generalize, to abstract, and see ourselves as one object among many, and ask ourselves, is this object doing the thing that's going to be maximally effective for it, or its society, or something else? And then change its behavior. We can reprogram ourselves. That's why we build bridges, and rocket ships and squirrels are still just gathering acorns. It never occurred to them to do anything different. So it leads to all these weird things, these powerful things, to logical conundrums. It also, the higher order thinking that is, it also leads to morality, as I'm about to argue. But for all of its amazing virtues, its origins are quite humble. I do not know exactly how our brains instantiate higher order thinking, any more than I know exactly how they instantiate, instantiate first order beliefs and values. But I know in principle how it could be done, with a feedback loop. The frontal cortex of our brains has plenty of room for very complex and intricate looping representations. And just as there's nothing supernatural about representations, there's also nothing the least bit supernatural about loops in neural circuitry. Any first year electrical engineering or computer science student knows how to construct feedback loops in hardware or software, looping some part of the system's output back to become a new input for the system to again respond to with very powerful effects. And indeed, at the end, we, uh, it's that fox truck, I think, that the kid is trying to, to do a feedback loop so he doesn't have to write the same phrase uh, 500 times on the board. Um, <laughs> very powerful devices, feedback loops. We use them all the time. Uh, now, in saying that moral values are higher order values, I have almost answered our original puzzle, but I do need to be slightly more precise first, because otherwise there's some objections that I would be open to. Let's think again about what valuational behavior is. It's not merely having some value. It's valuing something in response to some perceived facts. For example, the squirrel running away, uh, there's, I'm sorry, the squirrel values running away in response to the presence of the fox. I value drinking my water in response to my perception of thirst. A malicious person values tripping me in response to the anticipation of his imagined delight at seeing my pain, or perhaps a memory of some past um, harm that he thought I did to him. Let's call this connection between the input facts and the output value a valuational disposition. And uh, yeah, go ahead to the next slide here. Uh, so the higher order valuations I'm talking about are valuations. Not of values, but evaluations of a valuational dis disposition as such. That, and so this disposition is a habit, tendency, or behavior of valuing something because of or in the light of some perceived factual input. Okay, so it's, the va it's, we, it's our own valuational dispositions. In other words, we, we, you know, the squirrel has some input and some output. There's the acorn, I want the acorn. There's the fox, I don't want to, want to be near the fox. Okay. We stand back and we look at our own patterns of behavioral dispositions. So we look at both the input and the output and say, ah, I'm a kind of being who responds to this input with that output. I wonder if I want to still be doing that. So we look at the whole shebang, not just at the, val at the value. We don't just value the value. We value the disposition to value in that context, in those circumstances, or disvalue it. Next slide. And, okay, yeah, so here's the crucial move. Notice that if I value some valuational disposition as such, then logically I must value it wherever it is instantiated by anyone whomsoever. If I don't, I am being inconsistent with myself, or I have misidentified the actual disposition I purported to value. This leads directly to, or rather implicitly describes, the most well-known moral rule of them all, the universalization principle also known as the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's not just a now so nice sounding idea. It's simply a requirement of consistency in your own higher order valuations. If you don't follow it, you haven't really made a higher order valuation of a disposition as such. If you prove yourself conforming to some valuational disposition, but other people who would follow the same disposition would be very likely to frustrate your values then valuing that disposition is implicitly to value the frustration of your own values, which is straightforwardly inconsistent. It can, this, then, the golden rule, can easily explain why so many of us agree, for example, that stealing is wrong, in a way that even a professional thief must implicitly acknowledge, 
because even the thief disapproves of other people stealing from him. Precisely because one of his values is to make some use of the stuff that he has come into his possession. Notice here, it doesn't matter for the golden rule whether or not other people actually steal from the thief. The problem is that the thief is doing something which, if he'd thought about it carefully, he'd realize he didn't approve of himself. Its inescapable logic explains why versions of the universalization principle are so commonly found around the world, both in common morality and in philosophical approaches to it, including many attempts to offer a more precise technical formulation of it, such as the principle of moral supervenience, Kant's categorical imperative, and other versions that have been proposed by philosophers throughout time. Uh, but for my money, and I can explain it later if you like, but I, I think the golden rule actually is superior to Kant's formulation, although he thought it was the other way around. Uh, okay, uh, next slide then. So notice that if your values are inconsistent in the way I've described, the problem is not that I don't like you, or that society doesn't like you, or that God doesn't like you. The problem is that you don't like you, <laughs> for your values are in conflict with themselves and you've implicitly approved and disapproved of your own behavior simultaneously, of the things, the very things you purport to value. You've also disvalued them if you are caught in this inconsistent uh, valuation that I've described. If you ask yourself then what reason you have to act morally, the answer is that it is impossible to consistently approve of yourself doing anything else. Impossible to consistently think that anything could count as a reason to act immorally. That is a, something that you could treat, value yourself treating as such a reason. So in other words, the reasons to act morally are all the consistent reasons you could ever act on. That's a lot of them. <laughs> I think morality wins that fight. Now, of course, if you are a thief, the thought that you cannot approve of your own actions for what you are doing, or I'm sorry, you, the thought that you cannot approve of your own reason, of your own reasons for what you are doing, is a troubling one. Which is why it's tempting to rationalize your behavior by trying to make excuses for yourself, redescribing what you are doing so it sounds universalizable even when it isn't at all. Another strategy is just try to, to try to avoid thinking about what you're really doing and focus instead on how to do it or about something else entirely. But while there are many ways to evade our implicit negative self-judgment that higher order thinking makes possible in such cases, it is very hard to shut it out entirely. We know it under the name of conscience, the voice of the more consistent part of our minds, which is aware of what we are doing and of how we are trying to ignore it or silence its concerns in an increasingly recursive spiral of non-universalizable evasion, for you wouldn't want others to ignore the, their conscience in the way that you may be tempted to do. We can ignore the voice of conscience for a while, but there's always something there to be ignored whose existence is confirmed by all the strategies we use to try to escape it. Now, uh, the next slide. Uh, the Golden Rule has its critics, some of which correctly point some ambiguity in the Golden Rule, at least in its most common formulations. It is, I, I agree, ambiguous on at least three points. It's ambiguous about, which is quite a bit for, for such a short phrase, uh, it's ambiguous about the nature of doing, which could be referred to any behavior, or any intentional behavior, or any valuation, or any disposition to respond to certain facts with some valuation. Each of these would be different interpretations of doing. Uh, and remember earlier I said I had to be a little careful and say we're not talking about just valuing a value. We're talking about a valuing a valuational disposition. I think that's quite important and that leads to the right answer here. And why is this the right answer? Well, because any other interpretation of the Golden Rule leads very quickly to inconsistency, and hence by its own lights must be rejected. That is, if we apply the Golden Rule to itself, going higher order once again, it tells us how to apply itself, and thus clarifies or fixes its own ambiguities. Uh, quickly about the others. There, there is an, an ambiguity in the term others. Should we be concerned only about whether we would have all others acting as we are, or about any single or groups of persons acting as we do? What, how many does it take to be an other? Uh, again, I believe we must accept the latter formulation. Uh, and this is where Kant makes a mistake. He goes for the former. He thinks we have to con concern ourselves only with what would happen if all other people did as we were doing. But I think that's actually a narrowing uh, of the of rule. 
And again, leads to inconsistency if you apply it to, your, to itself. But if you apply the, the, if you interpret it as saying, well, how would I want any other person, not just all of them, but any one of them considered individually? How would I, what I want, what do I want them to do? If you apply the golden rule that way, and then you ask yourself, do, would I want others to apply the golden rule that way? Things work out much better. I'll, I'll give you an example in a moment, uh, but uh, uh, I'm just going to run through this quickly. Um, finally, the third ambiguity is the, concerning the meaning of what we would have to be the case. What does it mean that I would have someone do something or other? Uh, does it mean that any want or desire whatsoever counts as a legitimate basis of judgment? Well, that pretty quickly leads to inconsistency once again if you interpret the golden rule that way. Um, there's all kinds of examples. You know, the grocer would love if his wholesaler gave him all, the, all his wholesale goods for free, didn't charge him anything. Oh no, that means I can't charge my customers because <laughs> I have to do unto them as I want others to do unto me, give their goods away for free. Well, that doesn't work very well. Um, that's why you shouldn't apply the golden rule that way. You wouldn't want anyone else to do it that way either. Um, the solution here is actually a fairly simple one in, in logic. Uh, you can go both directions with a conditional statement. Uh, I want something, therefore I should do something else. Well, maybe if you don't want that other thing to happen, maybe you shouldn't have wanted it in the first place. So I think uh, uh, if I feel that I want someone to set, or I want others to satisfy some momentary whim of mine, or just some partial desire I've got, uh, but then realize that the requirement that I satisfy similar whims of others would lead to results I could not possibly countenance. This is evidence that I shouldn't have wanted others to satisfy my every whim in the first place. I should go back and correct the things I desire, rather than blindly accept that desire and try to impose it upon others. Uh, finally, we must remember that the golden rule must apply to all of our valuational dispositions, not just first order ones, but all higher order dispositions which, all higher order dispositions which govern or justify the lower order ones. And that takes care of all, I, th I think, all of the purported counterexamples to the golden rule. And there are many, but uh, I'll, I'll just mention one. So let's go to that one uh, on the slide. We put this together. Uh, oh, and this is, I'm sorry, yeah, this is just a quick intermediate slide. Just pointing out what I just did here, that um, the golden rule can fix itself if you ask yourself, how do I want others to apply the golden rule? And that's, that's in, in summary, what I did on those three uh, ambiguities, to fix those ambiguities. So yes, the golden rule has ambiguities. But when you apply it to yourself, ask yourself, how would I want others to interpret that ambiguity? It answers itself. It tells you how to do so. So it's self-correcting. Um, some philosophers try to build more things, conditions, and requirements into their basic principle of morality. Kant tries to do that, correcting some of the ambiguities in the Golden Rule. Unfortunately, I think sometimes he corrects them the right way and other times the wrong way. You actually do better if you start with a more general, generic Golden Rule and then fix itself as you apply it to itself. Uh, and that, uh, that goes through the, the process I have there. Okay, well let's go to the next slide then. Um, so, uh, counterexamples. There are many, but here's a favorite one that philosophers love to use. Uh, the masochist. Uh, we might imagine that a masochist following the, purporting to follow the golden rule by poking other people with pins. An act which strikes us all as intuitively wrong, of course. Suggesting that the golden rule is far too weak and misleading as a guide to moral behavior, because after all, perhaps the masochist does want to be poked with pins. Uh, but the masochist is not really following the golden rule. For while his bare actions is to poke others with pins, his full valuational disposition is to poke other with pins, others with pins in response to his desire to be poked with a pin, while lacking any evidence that those being poked share his desires, and much evidence that they probably do not. A disposition which is very unlikely to be one he could value at the higher order level. He couldn't value himself having that same disposition. Uh, for example, suppose he woke up the next morning and decided he wasn't going to be a masochist anymore. Would he still want others to follow that disposition he was following yesterday? Probably not. But just to close all possible loose ends, notice that this specific valuational disposition is an instance of a yet higher order disposition. Impose on other people desires you have, but which they do not share. That's the more generalized version of what the masochist is doing. 
If other people followed that disposition with respect to the masochists, but they didn't like pain, they liked something else, well, things will go bad quickly. It might involve tickling him with a feather. Someone else might really enjoy being tickled with a feather, but the masochist might be driven insane by this. He does not want other people to follow this higher order disposition with respect to him, given that he may not share their desires. So he's not following the golden rule. He's only pretending to. Um, or uh, you, would, couldn't, you don't even need to suppose feather, feather ticklers. <laughs> you just imagine uh, that we could uh, follow that uh, imposing uh, your values upon other people, your desires on other people, and we might follow that by depriving him of opportunities to be poked with pins. You know, stick him in a padded room, maybe. Pictures of windows in it. Um, uh, depriving him of opportunities to be poked with pins. Something that most of us would find very reassuring, but which would frustrate the masochist intensely. In short, our hypothetical masochist is only pretending or perhaps pre uh, uh, Oops. Is, only, is only appearing to or pretending to follow the golden rule. If we use then the golden rule carefully enough, I believe we will find that it confirms most of our common moral intuitions rather than violating them, supporting the view uh, that I'm putting forward that it is indeed the basis of our conscience. So such is morality, but we need now a few words both about erroneous moral theories and also about misapplications of the golden rule. I promise to fight with anyone advocating alternative moral theories, and here it is. For if what I've said is correct, then any other purported moral theory, that is general, foundational, fundamental moral theory, must be one that you could approve of anyone else adopting. And the general strategy you used for deciding upon that theory, described at a more general, higher order level, must also be one that you could approve of anyone else adopting. Take your favorite list of religious edicts. You might think that you could easily endorse its adoption at a as a universal principle. You might want everyone to adopt the morality of your specific religion. But now think about the second order or higher order disposition that led you to endorse your religion's morality in the first place. That is, what were the input conditions, the factual input conditions, that caused you to adopt the values of your religion's morality? Well, there's several possibilities. One is that you were taught that the religion was true. So you were, that was the input. You were taught the religion is true. The output is, I'm going to value whatever that religion tells me to value. Now, consider that second order disposition of adopting and acting on a religion's morality because you were taught it was true. Do you want anyone whatsoever, whomsoever, wherever they live and whatever they happen to be taught to follow that disposition, however it might happen to be instantiated at the lower level? I really don't think so. Just think of some other religious views, especially those you find most dangerously mistaken. They might pass those, or they may be satisfied by those input conditions. That is, someone else might have been taught that somewhere, and hence get adopted on the basis of that valuational disposition. But you cannot possibly approve of the harm they might do to your values when acting on their chosen religious values. Perhaps you think you have some more substantial criteria. There are many possibilities. Just pick one at random. Uh, say you find your religion to have a reassuring message about salvation. And that's the input conditions. Given that religious reassuring message, then you will adopt the religion's moral values. Well, let's plug that in again. Do you approve of anyone else, whomsoever, adopting a religion that has a reassuring message about salvation and following its moral code regardless of what that moral code says, regardless of its specific content? I don't think that will do either. There are lots of pernicious religions or cults that have reassuring messages about salvation. Indeed, we could go through many other possibilities, but any uh, test of religious truth or really higher order disposition telling you when to adopt religious morality, which does not consider the content of the religious moral code, is bound to be open to this problem. There's always going to be the actual or at least theoretical possibility that you will end up, by endorsing that higher order disposition, endorsing others adopting moral codes which are extremely harmful to your own values, whatever those are. Well, then you may think, ah, well, that's the solution then. Ah, uh, now I know I can tell you what my real disposition is. Uh, I adopted my religion because its proposed moral code passes some criterion which shows it to be the correct moral code. That was the criterion I used for adopting my religion. 
Well, if that's true, it becomes more plausible that you could indeed approve of anyone else doing likewise and only adopting religious moral codes that meet those criteria, depending upon what those criteria are, but that you have hope there. It might work. But now notice what has happened. You've admitted that there is some standard for moral correctness, which you can use to test any proposed moral views by a standard which did not come from the religion itself, for it is used to test which religion had the correct moral values. So no religion, or for that matter, no ideology, feeling, or instinct can be the ultimate source of values. To even accept one in the first place consistently, you must already have a conception of what is the correct standard of ethics. Furthermore, if I'm correct, we must all along be using the golden rule as a standard for morality. So why not simply conclude that the golden rule itself is that ultimate standard we seek? It seems that any attempt to replace or usurp its role must itself pass the test of the golden rule or be inconsistent with itself. Next slide. Okay, now I will not tire you with the details, but I will simply assert now that exactly the same thing can be said for a great many other proposals for the source of ethics, including many so-called secular or naturalistic ethical theories. This includes subjectivism, the social contract theory, egoism, cultural relativism, and versions of the so-called evolutionary ethics, which, which purport to identify ethical standards with various instinctual behaviors whose function is to preserve the very genes that cause them. I will not try to refute these one by one, but I will rest on the blanket statement that each of these principles can only be treated as a correct source of moral values if you could consistently value any other beings accepting them as such. I submit that this is impossible for any theory which postulates that some contingent genetic, social, or historical origin of values uh, are the mark of moral justification. Although, if you say, well, I'll only accept those values coming from society or evolution or whatever, that pass some moral criterion. Oh, then, again, that might work. But that means you've already got some criterion. So you're not getting all your moral values from genetics, morality, uh, uh, society, and so forth. Uh, next slide. My praise for the Golden Rule must close, however, by observing the potential for its abuse and misuse. This potential does not, I think, count against the principle itself, for as John Stuart Mill wisely observed, even the noblest moral principle is certain to lead to disaster if we assume it is implemented by idiots, or, we might add, by malicious hypocrites. And there are plenty of both, as I'm sure you have noticed. There are many ways of pretending to follow the golden rule, or even of sincerely convincing yourself that you have followed it without actually following it. I've already noted the example of the pin-poking masochist who focuses on the fact that a narrow first-order description of his action is one he could endorse being followed by others, ignoring the fact that the more uh, general and highly salient descriptions of his behavior, such as the fact that he is adding to the amount of value frustration in the world, are not so universalizable. This hypothetical masochist is only a philosopher's trope. Uh, just an invention of our brains. But many analogous abuses of the Golden Rule have been put forward as serious proposals, perhaps even sincerely. When hypocrisy is disguised under the veneer of an apparently hip universalizable principle, we call this rationalization. Nothing reveals rationalization quite so clearly as the fact that these supposedly universalizable principles are tailor-made to benefit their authors. And the description of our valuational dispositions supposedly falling under that principle are constructed out of facts selectively cherry-picked to make it look universalizable, while ignoring both many other relevant facts about the motivations behind the principle's adoption and the actual interests of other persons and how the principle affects them. I give you two instances. The writer Anatole France once quipped that the law in its majestic equality forbids the rich as well as the poor to sleep under bridges, to beg in the streets, and to steal bread. Universalizable principle, right? Well, the satire starkly reveals that superficially universalizable, universalizable laws and policies are often a mask by which suffering is imposed upon many for the benefit of a few 
who are fortunately situated enough to be immune to the suffering that their laws and policies cause. Quite recently, Michelle Bachman was asked by a high school student why gays couldn't marry. And without a trace of irony, she replied that they could. We live under a nation of laws where everyone has equal rights, she says. Everyone's treated universally. And our laws permit a gay man to marry any consenting woman of his choice, just as they permit straight men to do the same. <laughs> now, in each case here, the purportedly universalizable first order disposition conceals a more general, higher order disposition, which is not so universalizable, precisely because it endorses the selectively tailored construction of a lower order principle, which, if followed, is bound to cause great frustration to people with interests or positions different from those of the persons proposing the principle. By focusing all, only on the universalizability of our first order and tailor-made and cherry-picked first order principles, we can deceive others and even ourselves about our non-universalizable and deeply immoral higher order strategy. Arguments can sometimes change our views on morality, but sometimes mockery reveals our errors better. So I observed that Bachman would probably be less pleased with a law promoted by a Hindu that all U.S. citizens were equally free to attend any Hindu temple of their choice, but no other religious institutions. Same higher order principle. Exactly the same. Um, Next slide. Last slide, I think. In the conclusion, I cannot think of any better way closure to my points than with the insightful words of Samuel Butler from his wonderful novel, The Way of All Flesh. If you haven't read it, go out and check, check it out. Drawing a parallel between those who would justify some person's elevation to social or political status by fabricating a genealogy, this would be in England, of course, where if you had to marry the right person, you had to prove that you were of noble blood or something of that sort. Uh, so you, you invent a genealogy purporting to document an individual's noble lineage when a true recognition of our value as humans with the skills we actually have is really all the justification we need for getting social respect and opportunity. He assures us that there is no casting of swine's meat before men worse than that which would flatter virtue, that is morality, as though her true origin were not good enough for her. But she must have a lineage, deduced, as it were, from spiritual heralds, from some stock with which she has nothing to do. Virtue's true lineage is older and more respectable than any that could be invented for her. She springs from man's experience concerning his own well-being, and this, though not infallible, is still the least fallible thing we have. A system which cannot stand without a better foundation than this must have something so unstable within itself that it will topple over on whatever pedestal we place it. I urge you then to treasure morality, but not by falsely imagining that its authority comes either from the mouth of God or from hard wiring on our genes. Morality neither has nor needs any such justifications, and resting it on such flimsy bases would make it far easier to refute than it actually is. So I thank you for your attention tonight and invite your questions. Have one yeah. over here. Um, I've given up on uh, the Golden Rule so long I didn't even think people believed it. George Bernard Shaw, uh, don't do unto others as you would do unto them. They have a different taste. Uh, I think all learning theory mm -hmm. suggests we all have different learning histories and we'll have different mm -hmm. values, different tastes. So mm -hmm. I guess there is where I think I can't follow where you're at. Yeah, well, well Shaw, Shaw was responding to a misuse of the Golden Rule. The misuse of saying that the Golden Rule must be followed mechanically by asking step one, what do I want? Step two, what would I want others to do to get me what I want? Step three, do that same thing to them. And just mechanically go through steps one, two, three, one, two, three. Instead of ever going backwards and asking, well, should I want others to do that to me? Or you know, what, what, what's the more general pattern of behavior I want to do? And that's why I said you really have to understand the Golden Rule by asking reflexively, how would I want others to follow the Golden Rule? Do I want others to follow the Golden Rule in that mechanical, mind-numbing mind way of just doing on the, whatever would satisfy my desires if they were me? Well, no, I don't want them to do that. But that is following the Golden Rule to ask, how would I want others to do it? So, you know, if you ask yourself, you know, do I, do I, I mean, there is something to Shaw's point there. 
But I think you could derive that from the golden rule. Ask yourself, do I want others to pay attention to the fact that my values are different from theirs? That you know, I may want chocolate and they may want strawberry. Do I want them to be alive to that? Well, yes. So I should do the same myself. I should be aware of differences between their values and mine, not impose my values on theirs. But that's what the golden rule tells you to do, is don't impose your values on other people. Is that, is that actually the last slide, or did I? Oh, I'm sorry. Maybe I, maybe I, I skipped the message one, because I, I mean, didn't mean to end the bad uh, that quote there. But anyway, um, yeah, so um, yeah. Do you want others to impose their desires upon you? No. Well, then don't do it to them. So you, you, if you apply the golden rule to itself, you get Shaw's answer. But his, his answer is not a contrast to the golden rule. It reveals the correct result if you apply the golden rule to itself. That's what I would say. I'm back. Hi. Um, during your presentation, you talked about uh, how you would use second order questions to evaluate morality. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Well, the any value, any value. And when you do that correctly, you end up with morality. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So, where do you cap mm -hmm. how many orders you go back? Ah, ah. <laughs> You're a philosopher. Okay, <laughs> move in that direction. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is this is what I did my dissertation on, and I showed that uh, you 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 end up capping it with the golden rule, and and it, as, as you go higher order, you get more general. Okay. Uh, otherwise, it's pointless. You might as well go more general. Otherwise, you're just repeating yourself. Uh, and as you get more general, you strip out all the contingencies out out of each higher order principle as you go higher up. Well, there's a certain point where you can't strip out anymore. The golden rule essentially says uh, accept values which are consistently valuable at, at a yet higher order level. Uh, it asks for consistency. Okay, that's the input condition. Check to see if your values are consistently valuable themselves. Um, you can't strip out any more of that. If you say, well, let's, let's weaken that further. Let's generalize past that. Well, you can't generalize past consistency. There's, if you take consistency out of your input conditions, then you are openly endorsing inconsistent values. You don't want to do that. Uh, so you end up with the golden rule. And the golden rule approves of itself when correctly understood. So at that point, you can, you know, we, you know, it's not like it's at the seventh level or eighth level or whatever. You, just, you can prove that at some point you must hit the golden rule. The golden rule approves of itself. You don't need to go higher than that. And, then the, and the golden rule applies to all or lower order principles whatsoever. Okay. So you can stop there. Um, I, I have a follow-up question. Sure. Um, how would you use this golden rule to cash out something like the trolley problem? <sighs> okay, I'm going to have to explain the trolley problem first. Yeah. If, uh, um, it's uh, this is a, a conundrum in uh, physics. It, I mean, I'm sorry, in philosophy. Uh, maybe in physics too. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Where uh, we, we use it to test moral intuition. So the, the, obviously this Phil, who's been in philosophy class, or has read, read something on this. And um, uh, the idea is there's a run of, uh, out of control trolley or train, and you have to pull a switch that, you know, if you don't pull the switch, five people will die on one track. If you pull the switch, move to another track, one person will die. Should you pull the trick? And pull, the, pull the switch. And there's like a hundred different variations on this, making the problem more complicated. And, complex and weird and so forth and you know, your grandmother on one and a doctor on another and all kinds of weird complicated things. Okay, um, well, <laughs> how would I apply it? Um, the, there are always going to be situations where it's, it's tough. Uh, but, okay, so two, two couple things here. And I, I can't, as, as you know, there are a hundred different problem problems, not just one. And it depends on what variation you look at. Um, a lot of us have strong emotional reactions to doing things that cause immediate harm to people, especially people we're near and people we're touching and so forth. And this, is, this causes some variations in the trolley problem. Sometimes it seems worse if you sacrifice someone who's next to you than someone who's far away and so forth. And those, I think, are contingencies of our evolutionary background. Um, some of those evolutionary instincts, those value impulses we have, some of them are defensible at a higher order level. Some of them are not. Now, if they're partly programmed into us and we respond instinctively with them, we can certainly understand someone who just follows that immediately gut level impulse, I can't do that, you know, and they don't pull the lever. But 
that doesn't make it right if on reflection we think, well, you know, more good would have been done if you pulled the lever. And at the very least, we shouldn't condemn someone who overrides those gut level instincts, finds that in, them, in themselves the, the, the guts, so to speak, to uh, do the thing that would lead to the least harm. And so ultimately, I'm pretty much a consequentialist. This is another case where I disagree with Kant. Now, it's not always easy to be consequentialist. And sometimes consequentialism seems to go against some of our moral intuitions. I suspect that many of those moral intuitions are not morally defensible at the higher order level. But we can also understand why they're there, and it may be hard to resist them. So there's an element to which we can excuse and understand non-consequentialist reactions, even though I think we can better justify the consequentialist ones, minimizing the total amount of harm. Because you'd want others to do the same. If you were at risk of being harmed, would you want to live in a world where people act in ways that led to a 80% chance of people at random being killed or a 20% chance of people at random being killed? Well, given that you're probably one of those people at random who could be killed, I don't think you need to think too hard about what you want. But again, that doesn't mean it's not difficult in practice. Yeah. Uh, tell you first. Okay. Thank you. The golden rule seems like, okay, this is really clean, and you can really apply it to real life issues, and there is a clear right and a clear wrong. Mm -hmm. My gut feeling is life is more a whole series of trolley problems, mm -hmm. and that their, their situational ethics are more often in play than clearly I'm doing the right thing or I'm doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I'm, I believe there is much ambiguity. And this, this gets to an issue uh, that was debated, well, not debated because they lived a century apart, but uh, an issue that split the ethics of Immanuel Kant uh, and John Paul Sartre. Um, not, it's not, it wasn't just 18th century and 20th century and German French, but they had different ways of looking at this, even though, in a way, they both subscribed to a kind of universalization principle. Uh, Kant thought, you know, there is this sort of mathematical rigor to ethics, you can plug it into the formula and it'll pump out, you know, yes or no. You know. And then in his later works he said, well, I guess it's not quite as simple as that. And Sartre from the beginning said, oh, it's just tremendously complicated. Yeah, there's a few easy problems, but yeah, he, he was with you. Most problems in life are complicated. He said, sure, you, the, problem, the answer must be universalizable, but that doesn't help you very much telling you which one is universalizable, which, which answer is going to be the one that leads to greatest you know, benefit, hope, and so forth for mankind. Uh, which one would, you, would I want others to do? I, that's sometimes precisely what you don't know. Uh, so I'm, I'm with you there, actually. Uh, but I do want to point out, when you talk about situation ethics, I love situation ethics. I mean, to a point, uh, after all, remember what I said about valuational dispositions. They've got to have a factual input. And different factual inputs will lead to different outcomes. Uh, the same behavior in, one, in case A may lead to a different result in case A prime, which is similar but not quite the same thing. And the disposition to do something in case A is not the same as the disposition to do the same thing in A prime. I could approve of one and not the other. So I'm fine with hair splitting, with fine tuning, with uh, making these distinctions. Uh, but I think that that does not involve ever rejection of universal universalization. It resolve it revolves involves careful application of it. Uh, so I but I, I don't believe it's always easy. That's why I hesitate at the trolley problem is you know. It's a very complicated problem, and it's hard to know what to do. I think that's often the case. Uh, but I don't think you'll get clearer on it by saying, well, let's just toss out the universalization principle. Let's just do what feels right or something. That's ignoring the problem rather than solving it. Uh, lady. Um, so what I'm thinking about as we finish up here mm -hmm. is what a theist would respond like. So I'm trying to anticipate what mm -hmm. they would respond. Mm -hmm. With. And typically, when talking about why they have their religion, they say, well, the Bible says that it's true. And how do we know the Bible is true because the Bible says that it's true? It's, so it's circular, tautological, mm -hmm. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. doesn't really convince someone like me. Yeah. So I would think that if, if one of them was coming here, they would, mm -hmm. they would see universalization and the golden rule correcting itself as tautology. And how would, you, how would you dissuade them from that? Because I, I think they'd be wrong, but I think that's how they'd respond to it. 
So what would you what would you say to that theist to help them better understand why it's not just as much of a tautology as their circular Bible argument? You're good. You're good. That's yeah. No, this is uh, uh, and, and I, I left that out of this out of the main talk because I thought that's too complicated to get into. Uh, but that is a serious concern because superficially they look the same. They look like you've got this ultimate principle approving of itself, whether it's the golden rule or the divine command theory, and they just loop on themselves and hey, it's circular. Now I actually think that you know in in philosophy we rail against circular justification, circular thinking. Ah. It's, Circular thinking is right because circular thinking is right because circular. See, that doesn't work. We we run into problems very quickly there. Uh, <laughs> actually, I think circular thinking has been maligned. Uh, yeah, most of the time, circular thinking is wrong. Circular thinking is wrong in most cases because embedded in the circle is some contingent fact, some contingent choice or value. And that contingent choice is justified because the contingent choice justifies itself because of the contingent. Okay. And but but why is that contingent fact there? Why this book? Why this religion? Why? Well, it's just there because it's there because it's there. But, but why is that one there? Why is that? Why is the circle made with that one contingent element in it? Well, that was just picked arbitrarily. After all, you could have done what the devil does because the devil told you to do what the devil does because the devil told you to do what the devil. Okay, and you could have done that. You could have said, picked Zoroastrianism because Zoroastrianism tells you to pick Zoroastrianism. You know, so in each of those circles, you've picked the one that has an arbitrary element that uh, you like. You know, you, you, so it was a contingent choice to pick the, that one. Now the golden rule, yeah, it's circular. Uh, be consistent because it's consistent to be consistent because it's consistent. Okay. But notice there's nothing contingent in it. I could change one religion to another. I could adopt Nazism or fascism or communism or some other self-justifying thing as my ultimate foundation, which means that it's not rationally required for me to do that. If any circle works, then one's as good as the other. But the problem is they all have these contingent features in them. The, the golden rule only requires consistency of higher order justification of higher order valuation, I should say. You can't abandon that. You can't get rid of that and adopt something else instead because then you're adopting something inconsistent. You can only add to it. You can't replace it with something else. And, that, and so it's kind of what I, what I said uh, uh, somebody earlier about the, the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the reason this is ultimate. I, yeah, it was your it was your first question. I know in the back. That's it. Be, why why where, where do you stop at the highest level? Well, you stop with a, a circular justification where you can't get any simpler than that. You, there's nothing contingent in it. There's nothing else to strip out. Whereas if you go the circular justification of all believe in the Bible because the Bible tells me to believe in the Bible, you could take something out without immediately becoming inconsistent. There's nothing to take out of the golden rule without immediately becoming inconsistent. So that's my shorter version of the answer. Uh, maybe just put it another way. Circular reasoning is, is wrong if you, if you could have this, another circle of the same form and it would work equally well. The golden rule is, in a sense, circular at the, at the upper limit, but you have no choice but to accept it. If you strip it out, you are inconsistent. You can, you can abandon the others without being inconsistent, the other circles, but you cannot abandon the circularity of the golden rules justification without immediately becoming inconsistent. So it's, it's perhaps the only virtuous circle in philosophy. Most circles are vicious. This one is, is virtuous because you have no choice but to accept it. If, you, if it's logically impossible for you to not accept it, then I say there's nothing wrong with that circular justification, but it's unique in the world of circular justifications. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you've got to reject the golden rule. I think, I, where am I going to get in trouble if I say, don't ever do unto me what I would do to you? I, there's different learning tastes, so I will never consider doing to you what you should do to me. Because that's a faulty premise, and, and all data shows that. Learning theory shows you pair different reinforcers and you get different values. So. I mean, I guess I did it. My life is centered on the thing that the golden rule never is right. Um, and, and, and that's the way. And the, wait, wait, wait. And that's the way you'd want others to behave towards you is to not follow the golden rule. Yeah. I oh, okay. So. Then you follow the golden rule. 
You just admitted that that's what you want others to do to you. You want them to fall that way, and so you're going to do it that way yourself. I, I think higher order I, level. I think higher that's order level. Yeah. Not. See, so but here, but the, this this is why the, the higher or lower order distinction is so crucial because so many people yeah. follow the golden rule or or uh, analyze it on the first order level. And on that level, I can, would completely agree with you. The golden rule is completely wrong, completely leads to these false examples, these counterexamples, and we would just have to toss it out like Immanuel Kant said we had to 200 years ago. Yeah, if, if that's the only way to apply it is at the first order level, yeah, but it's not even essentially first order level rule. It's a, it's a higher order rule. And if we think in terms of higher order thinking, and we ask, and, and yeah, the first order level, again, it has these ambiguities. I talked about these ambiguities in it. And if you apply it in, in the ambiguous, in one of these ambiguities in the wrong way, yeah, it would lead to all kinds of problems. I'm totally with you there. But I think if you go higher order, you fix all these problems. Now, the golden rule is, you know, I said it's good because it's common, everybody understands it, and I think you understand it better if you go a higher order level. There is indeed, I think, a more precise formulation. I brushed over it very quickly. It's called moral supervenience. And this is a conception that some philosophers came up with in the mid-20th century. It's a more technical way of getting at the universalization principle, and I think it actually has much less ambiguity in it. Um, the basic idea of, of, of the of moral supervenience is um, follow those dispositions or those behavior patterns, um, or not even quite this, right? What, let, me, let, me, let me try it more precisely. Uh, I'm, not, I'm going from memory here, not from a text. Uh, whatever moral judgment you would make in one case on the basis of some features of the situation, you must make the in to be consistent. Make the same judgment in any other case with the same features. Okay. Now that's that's more technical and but it's more precise and it has less of the ambiguities of the golden rule. Um, still, though, I think it's going to lead to the wrong results unless you apply it at the higher order level, and then it fixes itself. And and that's why when you when you say you know I want others to follow something other than the golden rule, so I'll follow it myself. Well, just listen to yourself. You're following it, the golden rule, at a higher order level. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, just thinking about how a theist might react to this. Um, I know that a mm -hmm. lot of the popular apologetics, like coming out of William Lane Craig, they would view this presentation, mm -hmm. and it would start at the beginning where you kind of start at that meta-ethical level, and you say there are moral facts. I can see sure. them asking you what like, mm -hmm. what grounds those moral facts? What are the truth makers, the natural truth makers for those moral facts? Uh, natural truth makers. What do you think they mean by natural truth makers? Well, I was just borrowing that term because you had a, this was a naturalistic effort. Right. Um, well, uh, I mean, I think I explained that. I think I said that, it, uh, but, but let me try to summarize it in a different way here. Uh, what grounds it is the fact that no recursive system of thought could approve of its behavior unless it accepted these moral values, of some certain values of respect for others and universalizability, that kind of thing. Unless you accept those, and, and whatever follows from that in any particular situation, which might be very complicated, whether in ordinary life or in trolley problems, uh, unless you accept that, you are inconsistent with yourself. And that, I think, can be proven. Okay? Uh, I haven't done so rigorously tonight, but I've tried to point you in the direction of why rejecting it leads to inconsistency. Um, and then if you want, if you, if you say, well, that sounds too abstract, what, where's the naturalizability? Well, then I point back to my slide with uh, the logic circuits and recursivity, and I say, well, build me a logic circuit that values and represents things uh, that is consistent while consistently valuing its own behavior but rejecting the golden rule. Well, you wouldn't be able to do it. You couldn't even describe how to do it. Okay. Uh, our brains are at some level somehow recursive. We look upon ourselves, we evaluate our own behavior. And that is what, what moral judgments are, is judgments of our own valuational behavior. And uh, if, you, if that requires universalizability, then it requires universalizability. You're not making a higher order judgment of a disposition as such 
unless you are, uh, are judging it universal, universally. That is, wherever it appears, whether in my mind or in your mind or your mind. or you know, uh, if, if you're not evaluating it the same way, wherever it appears, then you're not making a higher order judgment. You're like a squirrel then. You, know, you can be a squirrel, but a squirrel is not making a moral judgment. Um, so that's what grounds it. Um, and the details of it, you know, enmeshed in, you know, we, we can talk about logic circuits and neural networks and how these are instantiated, but it doesn't really matter how they're instantiated. Somewhere in there, there's a loop. And you cannot build this recursive loop in any way out of any materials unless it follows this logical pattern. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like logic, okay? We can talk about AND gates and NOR gates and all kinds of logical circuits, and we can talk about how to build them out of silicon and copper, but that's not the interesting part. The logic part tells you how it must function whatever you build it out of. It doesn't matter what you build it out of. And so you can see, it, it, when I talk about uh, ethics being naturalized, it's naturalized in the same way that logic is naturalized. Okay? Logic itself is a set of abstract facts about how recursive networks or how uh, truth values can interact with each other in certain ways given certain assumptions. Logic is, a, I'm sorry, morality is a set of values that fall out of or are required for the consistency of any system of higher order values that reflect upon themselves. How those are instantiated, I don't know, but they're going to be instantiated by some naturalistic features of the universe. Neural circuits, silicon, whatever, you know. Different, one thing in my head, another thing in the head of a Martian or the Android data, but it's going to be some kind of naturalistic instantiation. And, and again, there's nothing, no reason to think it can't be so instantiated. All, all you need is a loop or a set of complicated loops. That's the naturalistic part. But uh, I, can, I can prove, I think, that however you build it, it's got to conform to the laws of logic and it's got to conform to the laws of morality, or it is inconsistent. So that's the naturalistic basis. That's the, that's the truth maker. But it's not a contingent truth maker. It's not like, you know, you know, maybe something would be different in, you know, if we used titanium instead of, you know, neurons. No, it, it's, it, you can't work out any other way. Uh, but it is built out, however it's built, it's built out of naturalistic facts, neurons, etc. That probably wouldn't satisfy them, but it's the it's what I got. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Got anything that came up? This higher order thinking. Uh, it, it's interesting that in some ways it's it's. I think it's the heart of philosophy. It's it's central to philosophy, and yet the idea of thinking of morality as or uh, as a higher ordered system of values is relatively recent. That is to, to systematically focus on this. But I have found in the last uh, 15 years, there have been some articles coming out on fixing the golden rule, which mostly has been trashed by philosophers throughout history. They've said, oh, garbage, for the same reasons you had. You know, it, it, it leads to the wrong results. We have different values. And it's just obviously completely wrong. We need to go well, well past it. And then some people start saying, well, wait, wait a second. If we apply it to ourselves, then these conundrums fix themselves. We, 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 it shows us that you, don't, you aren't following the golden rule unless you pay attention to the fact that other people's values are different from yours and you have to treat them differently on the basis of that and so forth. And that made so much sense. Uh, and I just found an article last year, published last year, that makes the same point about Kant's categorical imperative. That there's this problem in, in the in philosophical discussion of um, you know, this categorical imperative, which is a more philosophical version of the universalization principle, tries to be more technical. But there's this problem of, well, what if you describe your principle that you're testing with the categorical imperative in a way that passes it, but is yet obviously crazy? Well, that looks like the categorical imperative doesn't work, so you try to fix it and fix it. And someone published this article last year that said, well, wait, just ask yourself, would I want other people, could I endorse other people, uh, messing up their principles that way, uh, Kant called the maxims. De describing their maxims in arbitrary ways uh, to make them, them look like they've passed their cat the categorical imperative test. No. Oh, well, that's the answer then. <laughs> You're not supposed to do that. You apply the categorical imperative test to itself, and that tells you how to apply it. And I think that's the right answer. I'm surprised that it's taken so long 
for this to occur to anyone. Um, and, and there are a few other examples of this. Um, another interesting thing I might comment, I, I kind of do with this with uh, rationalization, and I think uh, this is a very re uh, a recent thought that's occurred to me, that, is that this explains what rationalization is. Um, it's, the, it's making something look rational. How do you make it look rational? You describe the behavior in ways that it sounds like you could endorse it universally. It sounds like you could approve of everyone doing it. I'm sure Michelle Bachman sincerely thinks she could endorse you know, strict laws regarding uh, heterosexual only marriage uh, to apply to everyone. I also think I know why she thinks that. Because she's heterosexual. And she doesn't think she needs to accommodate anyone else. And so she thinks she'd be okay with everyone applying that. Well, maybe on one level, first order level, she would. What she's forgetting is the second order level, which is the question of how did she formulate that universalization of heterosexual marriage only. Did she perhaps formulate it in a way that benefited people like her and hurt people who were not like her? Maybe. You know, we can think about that. Uh, that's what rationalization is, though, is cherry-picking your facts, cherry-picking your description of your behavior so that it looks universalizable, even though your, your total behavior is not universalizable. On some level, you're doing something you don't want others to do, like making your sexuality legal and making all others illegal. That is something Michelle Bachman does not want anyone whatsoever to do. <laughs> but... She doesn't describe her behavior that way. She describes it another way. That's rationalization. Another interesting uh, connection is with the idea of uh, arguments by analogy. And this is something I noticed uh, just a year ago or so that uh, this, this talk about the universalization, universalization principle and higher order thinking explains why arguments by analogy are so common in ethics. They're common in other areas as well, politics and, and a few other areas of philosophy. But uh, an argument by analogy is essentially looking at another situation and trying to generalize over the, situ the analogous situation and the original one to implicitly figure out what are the higher order principles that apply to both. Okay, so when you say this situation is like this other one, here's what's true over here, so the same thing must be true over here. Well, think about the case, ways in which the two are alike. That tells you something about the higher order principle that you're implicitly appealing to. And then that higher order principle leads to specific lower order principles in each of the cases. Um, not sure if I can come up with a specific example. We have tons of them in philosophy. Uh, the trolley or problem, in a way, is like one. You know, we, we re almost never in our lives do we come across situations where we have to stop a trolley out of control from hitting five people. But in wartime, you might come across analogous situations. In medicine, you might come across analogous situations where you have to allocate resources that could save one person in front of you or five people far away or some other combination. And you might think about that. Well, how do, you, how do we deal with that? Well, sometimes it help, it's helpful to use an analogy. Go abstract yourself to a distant situation, one you're not likely to be in, and hence one you don't have any habits of thinking about. You don't have any preformed judgments on it. And ask yourself, what seems right in this analogous situation. And then if I've got the situation framed right and I get the right answer and I apply it over and I think it's applicable back to my ordinary life over here, maybe where we're not talking about trains but about something else, medicine, whatever, you're implicitly appealing to a higher order principle, something like save the many over the few or something else. And by looking at that analogy you're trying to test out, tease out your implicit higher order principles. Again, this suggests to me why this is so important that we think at the higher order level. And we, again, we all do this, but we're not ex doing it explicitly. We're not always aware that we're going to the higher order level. But I think if we were a little bit more conscious of that, we could more explicitly understand what it is that we're doing and how we're thinking when we think about ethics as well as many other areas of life. So I think this is all of philosophy, but for net tonight it's ethics. Uh, but I think a higher order thinking is essential to being human, let alone to being a philosopher. So it's important stuff. <laughs>